Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I'm Brennan Hall. I'm your host for the next 45 minutes here. We've got two of the finest uh, in the country or the most frequent, I should say, of uh, a, a, a custom report that I think is underutilized here at Huddle um, that is having a lot of value uh, on the field for teams that are applying it. Uh, I'm going to let these guys introduce themselves quickly. Uh, gentlemen, it is, it is an honor. And you guys are just starting football today or this week. Uh, so I, I'm you lo lot to, lots to cover, but I want to let you guys introduce yourselves real quick and we'll get right into it. Hi, uh, my name is Rich Upson. I'm a quarterbacks coach at Marshfield High School, Marshfield, Massachusetts. I've uh, been coaching in Marshfield since 2009. Uh, I've also been at a couple other schools, but originally from Marshfield and nice to be back in my alma mater. I've uh, really started to dive into a lot with uh, custom reports and what we'll talk about with what's next reports as well. Morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Padilla. I am the defensive coordinator and linebackers coach for Hart High School in Southern California. Uh, been at Hart for three years. Uh, been around a little bit, about 17 years, but uh, um, looking forward to uh, a good shortened season. Uh, with the help of Huddle, and uh, um, just looking forward to going over what I uh, I think is invaluable to uh, to our seasons. Well, let's get into that first. I, I don't think people are too familiar with the, the power of this thing. So, I, so Rich, um, let's show these people what it's all about. Yeah, absolutely. Hold this up. All right, so what we got here is this is one of our games from last year. And all I've done is I've just pre-selected the game. And we're going to just run this what's next report. You see I've run a couple down here. Um, what we'll do is just run it for this single game. So I'll click on my reports tab. You'll see what's next right here under offense. Click that, create it. I'll get created down the bottom here. I'll open it up. So just a quick overview here it's showing after a run of 10 or more yards, we're seeing this team was then again running 100% of the time. And we'll dive a bit more into this report. This is the general overview, gives you some run pass scenarios, some down and distance scenarios, and some game changing scenarios such as turnovers or some big plays there. Uh, I, I want to, there's a lot of different ways I think people can leverage this more than what we even think possible. Um, I'll, I'll start with you, Dave. Um, I, I want to just learn some, about some of the ways you use it. We'll, we'll start with um, where I think this is really crucial is, is down in distance tendencies. Yeah. So looking at it from a season progression perspective, um, uh, the, the, down and distance tendencies are, are in the early season are a little precarious. You don't have uh, a lot of data. Uh, so you're kind of working with last year's film and then you have different personnel. So um, early, early uh, season statistics by individual player um, becomes pretty valuable early. Uh, I know Rich is kind of getting into the custom reports, but what I've started to use is um, uh, individual player stats, it kind of requires uh, a little more front end data entry, um, but the results are worth it because it lets you build the report and see where the where the bulk of the load uh, as far as uh, what the who the team depends on um, in conjunction with the down and distance tendencies that helps you fill all the holes in game data. Um, and then once you get into midseason, you have plenty of, of, of data to build that strategy and call sheet. But Huddle allows you to uh, kind of put individual, individual games side by side uh, and then compare in multiple facets. Um, by series, by situation, and by field zone. And then uh, if your data allows, um, which, which uh, blitz packages and coverage coverages were most problematic for that offense. Um, but Rich, I don't know if you have those. Uh, were we going to put up those game scripts that I sent in or we're just going to talk about them? You want to put them up? 
Um, where I didn't see them in here. Are they in this? Hold on, let me pause it. All right. Great. All right. So I guess Dave, you'll I guess yep. wa uh, like start into Monday again, and then I'll pull this up. Yep. Okay. So so now looking at it as a for a uh, through the week, we'll start with Monday. Um, Monday is what we call our our walk and talk day. We just kind of go over personnel for the week, uh, what our proposed game plan is. Uh, this sheet is kind of a, it just it has everything on it that we could possibly use. Um, and then from there it whittles down, but um, the down to distance uh, reports are, are factored into all the bits, uh, blitz packages and uh, as long with the with kind of the fronts and the coverage would use uh, for the week, and and then so you see there's a lot of kind of it's just kind of uh, a generalization of what we'd use for the for the yeah. Next Rich, week. if you don't mind uh, zooming in a little bit on that so we can see that clearly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it's all the fronts we'd use, um, personnel groups, and anything at all possible that we might be able to use for that week. So then if we go to Tuesday, um, Tuesday is kind of, uh, we progress into kind of hopefully at game speed. Um, tighten up and narrow down specifics. Uh, Blitz packages in in situational uh, concepts and and coverages. Uh, formation recognition is a big part of this also. Um, and just bear in mind, all of this, everything on this sheet is pulled from huddle data. So um, uh, and then if you see, we have a five live segment. Um, yep, the right five. Here. The five live segment uh, mimics uh, a real-time game series. Uh, we utilize all the field zone reports um, and every, every team and live segment uh, we use uh, comes from huddle uh, field zone reports and, and down the distance. Dave, I got a question about that. Are those, sure. is that five live? Will that be like, top five plays say from that opponent offense that you're expecting or what goes into selecting those plays for that five live? That's exactly it. It's their top five uh, uh, in terms of percentages of what they'll use in those situations. So we'll, we'll bring out the sticks for this and uh, using it down a distance, we'll say, okay, this uh, first and 10 situation, this is what they're going to use second and long, uh, third and long and third and short are the five top. And, and this really, we don't do a lot of live uh, in our week. So this, this is basically the biggest live segment of the week. Yeah. After this, we kind of tone it down. So yeah, that's we're exactly very, right. We're very similar. Like our situational periods are going to be our lives. So whether, you know, it's a third and short day or a third and long day, that's typically our smaller live period than Sounds like we're a very similar practice format in that way. Right, exactly. So then, then when we go to Wednesday, uh, as one of my head coaches used to say, by Wednesday, the hay's in the barn. Uh, your game plan is pretty much set. Um, we have our personnel packages together. We have situational things set up. Um, it was some small tweaks, and then uh, we run through our automatics, which I think we'll talk about later. Um, but Wednesday, what you see up here is basically what I'm going to conglomerate into the, the, the call sheet. Um, and then we go to the call sheet for game day. I and mean, before we jump to that, Dave, so you guys, it sounds like you kind of cast like a wide net on Monday, and then by the time you're getting to Wednesday, say you had, you know, 10, 10 groups in fronts on Monday, those are pared down to what your final 
four or five are going to be for that game day then. That, exactly. That's exactly right. Um, and then, and then one other thing I was, I noticed was interesting. How do you, how do you guys factor in motion to what you're doing here with your fronts and stunts? Um, I know like on the earlier one, I was seeing some motion. Do you guys put a ton into that or are you still more formationally based for your front and stunts than motion based? more it's it's more formationally based um if we see in the data that in specific motions if we have a if we have a tight end if we're in 21 personnel if they're in 21 personnel and and the tight end motions to the to the boundary at a certain time then we may throw that in uh for some special uh uh change in front or change in coverage but other than that it's formationally based gotcha and then we'll jump to game day and zoom. there we go now this is fantastic yeah. by the way <laughs> yeah th uh, this is great uh yeah that's i got to give some credit to my head coach but he helped me develop this um yeah, but I, basically it's a color-coded uh, huddle data sheet. Uh, you know, it's, it's everything, everything the data shows us along with how practice went that week and what really works. I mean, you can have all the data in the world and want to run something specific, but if your personnel doesn't allow you that luxury, we, you kind of have to go with uh, something that does work. But um so yeah, it's 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 everything whittled down from Monday, and this is what uh, is our best chance for success on Friday. I'm curious, Dave, what do you guys do in these situations, like second and short, where it is a toss up as far as run pass? Like, is that kind of game feel at that point as to how you, how you're going to call, or will you just try and call you know a more balanced run pass defense yourself? early on at least well i i think a couple of things go into that it, it it depends on where we're at in the game if we're up and we're doing okay then I, you know i'll keep it pretty vanilla and and we'll just try and keep them in front of us if if we're down and it's second and short and we're kind of need to make something happen then uh then we'll go a little you know a, a lot more aggressive um uh also how I mean, you could have all the information in the world, but sometimes things just aren't going your way that night. So you just kind of have to throw throw something out there and hope it sticks. Yeah, because I, I know like we, we'll have a couple. We have a couple opponents that we'll see three different coverages and trying to. It, I feel like trying to figure out the rhyme or reason as to why they're in that coverage. And then, all right, how am I going to call a play to try and leverage it when I can't get a good beat on what coverage I think I'm actually going to get? So I was just curious to see from the other side of the ball. Like, we end up doing a pretty similar thing. All right, if, if we're up, then we might play it a little bit more conservative. If, you know, we're behind or it's competitive, we might play it a little bit more aggressive and try and push it regardless of the coverage we're seeing there. Right, right. Well, like, I mean, uh, as you try and do what, what – our, our objective is to make you as uncomfortable as possible. So, um, and, and it, if, if what I'm doing isn't really making you alter your, your attack, then I have to try something else. So, you know, it, it, it all depends on the personality of that offense you're going up against, I think. Yeah. And I, I, I think something that I've always given our defensive coaches a hard time. Like, Oh, it's easier for you guys. The offense doesn't change week to week. Sometimes you get like that week to week defense and you, you practice against like a too high look. And then you show up and they're in a four, four, everybody's manned up. And it's like, all right, well now we got to kind of coach it on the that fly. Yeah, so exactly. <laughs> so exactly. I, I, I try and give our defensive coaches a hard time. The offense isn't going to change that much week to week. But, and, but there, there you go. I, I, conversely, you know, if I want to, if I'm disguising my two shell and I'm moving it around and the offense I'm going against is just saying, piss on you, I'm just going to do whatever the hell I'm going to do. Yeah. And, you know, then I just, okay, I'll try something else. Yeah. Or it's like those early season games. If I brought up a good point about like the lack of data, 
you get a team who, you know, they've played say two defenses back to back that are odd fronts. Well, that doesn't mean that necessarily, even if you have a decent amount of data, if you're even front defense, you might see a completely different style of game as far as how the offensive coach is going to call. So I think it's a situation where you can end up in that too, is trying to not really guess, but may, you know, forecast what's going on with the offense. And it's a little tough. Yes. Yes. Great point. Yes, exactly. So here, and then is this, this, is this the same one? Yeah, this is the same one here. I think Uh, that, yeah, that's the same one. It just kind of, the, the difference between the, the previous and this one is just, uh, the previous was an early season game sheet. This is a mid season game sheet and there's, you Mm -hmm. know, there's some, there's, some more uh, in terms of my what next and coverage checks. There's more, uh, just more. Yeah, you see that I down can... here in line 36. Yeah, what's next? <laughs> yep. Yeah, and is this? I, I think this is another point to get this data later in the season. You talk about like it can require some more front end work as coaches, but then I think for us, assist like huddle assist has been a huge help and getting a lot of that initial data out of the way, which I know you and uh, Dave, you and I have talked about this you know, prior to this, that it allows you as coaches to then kind of dive into the data that we want to dive into, which is that tends to be a bit more fun than getting that basic data out of the way there. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's a little bit, the tedium in the beginning is, you know, it's understandable, but what you get out of that uncomfortable situation and writing all that, or, uh, putting in all that data entry, it reaps a lot of rewards down the line. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, so we're, we're going to, we're going to get into the role huddle assist and all this in, in, in a second. I want to, I'm going to sound like a clubhouse uh, host here, reset the room and talk about the uh, <laughs> uh, automatic checks. Again. This is a really interesting uh, topic. I mean, like for instance, when I've seen teams that use this, um, in game, day, they'll see a formation and they're already yelling it out. And it's like, um, I'm curious what role this plays in how you devise those, those automatic checks, those, those alert calls, if you will. Um, and, and, and how that helps fill out the game sheet. Uh, the, your automatics are, are, or the way I use them are very important, but, um, I mean, to, to preface that, I think, in life absolutes and and uh, always you try not to do right yeah um but they they um with good data you can you can make those uh situations where uh are that are uncomfortable kind of work in your favor and have the confidence to to make calls mm-hmm. without uh without kind of worrying about it also um fundamentally i kind of like the automatic checks because it gives the kids some freedom they can forget about what i just called if they see something on the field that we deemed automatic they just say everything's off we're running this and it kind of lets them flow a little bit better um the the what next data uh, along with down the distance, take a lot of the guesswork out of the equation. So um, if I know that 90% of the time uh, on third and plus five, they run four verts and he takes a five-step drop, uh, you can figure out what your best pressure is for that. And then you just, you, you go. So it, it, it's, a, it's a great help. You may not use it, but three times a game, but still, those three times are are could be, you know, uh, essential to the game. And do you do you find Dave too that I think there's a lot of coaches where I, I'll, I, even coaches that I've coached with in the past or currently we talk about like all this data, and I think there's a concern sometimes that you're gonna information overload the kids, and I, I think what it's important for coaches to remember is that the kids are only getting a percentage or a sliver and it's really up right. to us to be that filter for them, give them the relevant data that, as you're saying, like why the automatics can just allow them kind of flow. So if we know, for example, we had an opponent last year, I, I realized that when they had like a, 
unbalanced set. They were a hundred percent outside run to the imbalanced side. Right. And just giving our kids that automatic to be like, Hey, all right, we see this. We, now we can just clear anything else off and, and attack that. I, I think that's a good point by you. It does give the kids a lot more freedom. Uh, yeah. I, I think the, the biggest, um, not problem, but the biggest issue as far as uh, the kids go is they're always worried they're going to make a mistake. So worrying about making a mistake either uh, either makes you make that mistake or it slows you down that half a second. So this kind of just gives them confidence and lets them go. So it's I think it's great for them. Yeah, we'll, we'll say, because we're in up-tempo, we'll say, all right, even if you make a mistake, as long as you're going full speed, we can fix it after. Do, exactly. Do something wrong, but do it fast. Okay, you still might back end into something, you know, a decent play, even if you did it wrong there. Right. So it's I mean, not I, the I, worst thing in the world. I must say, if you're going to make a mistake, just make a huge mistake then. Just <laughs> go. And they, 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 just want, they just want you to know they are not going to get pummeled if they make a mistake. It's, right. As, as James Joyce would say, uh, a, a man's errors are his portal of discovery. <laughs> I'm gonna write that one down, Brendan. Yeah. <laughs> um, Dave, I want to go move on to the next slide. I want to go back to the call sheet real quick because um, you've shown me this several times, and every time I'm just blown away by the simplicity of it. I think you, you see a lot of call sheets. Certainly, watching NFL Sundays, I mean, you see like that that Ben McAdoo. Uh, Jersey diner menu looking thing. Um, th this is really simple, um, and I and I, I just think about the the the, the application of it through the um, the huddle beta, which we're we're uh, slowly pushing coaches to adopt. Um, just how easy is it to fill out with that? How how long does this take you to fill out typically? Um, it take well. First, I I got a I got a shout out to coach Coach Ed Croson at Chaminade High School. He helped me develop this uh, along with Coach Davey. So I want to give them some credit off the bat. Um, it takes, well, I mean, it's the progression. Like we went through Monday through, through, um, uh, through Thursday or Wednesday, but after the date is in and after we've gone through practice and this gets, uh, this gets put together on a, probably a Wednesday night into Thursday. So it's about a, it's about a two and a half to three hour process, but uh, you know, a lot of that is I'm second guessing myself and going back and forth on it, but th that's about what it is. Um, but yeah, when you, you know, the, the, this is really just the, the last piece of the puzzle in the, in the conglomeration of huddle, huddle data um the the put into a format that is is you know visually and aesthetically uh easy for me to read and uh, the and the coding never changes so once you kind of get going with it you're uh it's easy to just pop in and out and and uh uh get your situational calls um i mean it's basically data doesn't lie um if you have the tools Huddle gives you, it's in front of you. You have the peace of mind to to get after it and and make some some really good calls in uncomfortable situations. And on the bottom right here for field zone, Dave, would that be if you're seeing some big tendency on a certain area of the field that you're gonna? It's either gonna is that gonna be a require like a check for you uh, to like a change in your base defense or what is, what are you usually putting in that field zone area? Now, if, if a certain team has that tendency in a, in a certain, and a hundred percent tendency in a, in a, in a, you know, between the 40 and the 50, but a lot of, I carry a, uh, this is laminated. So I carry a dry race on the field so I can usually write in and, and look at stuff and fill it in during game time. Mm -hmm. So when we make adjustments at halftime, I can go to that and say, okay, we're here. And blah, blah, blah. Gotcha. So yeah, so that's... next time they get into that field zone, 
might just be referencing back what they did the previous time or something like that. Exactly. Exactly. Gotcha. Well, so going on to our next topic real quick. Um, they tell me more about the, the role that huddle assist plays in, in all of this and how it streamlines the process. Yeah. It, that it's, it's, I mean, without it, I don't know. <laughs> I, I probably we'd be divorced right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let me start by there's, there's, I think 10 columns in uh, your huddle assist. That's, that's requisite in, in getting your game plan together uh, down distance, hash yard line, play type result gains or loss formation, strength and play direction. If you have those, those bits of information for a full game, you are, you, well, for defensive anyway, defensively, you can get everything done. It's instrumental for the game prep uh, in terms of time. Uh, you know, from the end of the game on Friday, then, the, you know, the clock starts ticking. And then, you know, you have scouting that game, uh, breakdown, corrections, then your upcoming scout film, scout cards, scout team prep, install, run through, you know, coach, I'm preaching to the choir, but you know, this, this, the, and then it, that doesn't even take into account life. So uh, to break down and coach, you may be, you may do this faster than me, but to break down one scout film takes probably Two and a half hours to completely break it down. Uh, and if you're in mid-season, that's five games. So that's 10 hours of, of time during the week. So uh, huddle assist, that's invaluable. That gives you back 10 hours of your life that uh, you wouldn't uh, regularly have without it. So, you know, I've, I, cre I credit Huddle Assist with uh, a lot more than just football. Yeah, we're, I, I've uh, started because you know, our season just is getting ramped up. And so our first opponent, it's a couple of weeks out, but uh, some film from past seasons. And it's about two hours, two and a half hours to go through and break down the way that I know we're going to want it as a staff. And that's really just for the things that I want out of it as a staff, not even what the other coaches. So, you know, you think right. about – if it's two hours for myself to analyze and break down what I want, you know, factor that by each coach on the staff. And it is a significant portion of time for the entire staff uh, that is saved there. Um, and as right. I mentioned earlier, Dave, it, it, it does take assist is really helpful in taking like that, the tedious data and getting that done for you. So that absolutely. Like, I know, you know, I want to see what the, as an offensive coach, like I, I want to dive into what is the defense? What are their blitzes? What, are, what are their coverages? I want to be able to study that and watch those clips five and six times, you know, over, and you right. want to do the same thing. All right. How are they blocking this run play, you know, so that right. we can be prepared for that. And that to us as coaches. And I assume most coaches that are watching this, that that's the stuff that why we coach. It's not to break right. down. All right. Do they gain two yards there or three yards there? Let me input that data. It's the, the, you know, minutia, the minutia, I guess, that is really what gets us excited about coaching and that chess match against each other. Right. And, and, and most of the time it's that minutia that, that sets you apart. If you take the time to separate it, that that's what makes your game plan better than the other guys, basically. Yeah. And as you show up to game day, you, you probably get a good idea of how, how the game might go, you know, factoring in other conditions, but you got a good fee either. You know, I I've been there as a coach. You're just like, Oh crap. Like we, we are just, we don't have either a good read on this team or, you know, combined with what they do is just really tough for us. And you know, by Friday, generally what, what to expect, you know, from the other staff. So if you can be prepared and then just leave it up to the kids at that point, that's, really all we can do as a coach. Absolutely. No. I want to, I think the, the last half of this session, I want, uh, there's two things I want to cover. Um, one is, is uh, Rich, I'm interested to see how you pair this with some of the other custom reports um, in, in huddle. And then um, 
I want to talk about some of the unique applications, some of the stuff that, let's be frank, Dave, initially attracted me to uh, talking to you. <laughs> it's just that you, you use it in some very unique ways that uh, I, 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 I think people want to learn more about, you know. So uh, let, let's go over to Rich first. Rich, because uh, you have a prepared presentation. I want to, I want to see, see what you got. Yep. All right. Let me share. So for us, I do a lot of self-scouting and I started using what's next report for that self-scouting. So I'm going to talk about what's next and also how I use it with formation reports to see where we can improve our play calling uh, as a staff for our report. So here I showed how to make a what's next report. Here's an example of one. This was three games for us last year. Our, we play a seven game regular season. So I like to do a mid game, uh, excuse me, a mid season self scout um, just for us. Cause depending on the defense, I don't love doing a self scout after every game. Uh, so this was three games last year, you know, and, and what is it showing here? Um, it's showing that this after three games, I'm starting to get some reliable data here. You'll see there's some question marks or uh, some exclamation points, excuse me, along with these. And that's just basically, huddle letting you know that, Hey, there isn't, there's not a lot of reliability here. You see these percentages are somewhat low and you also see, you know, only two out of nine times. It's not a lot of data there. So it's just letting you know that this is what the data is showing, but it might not be a hundred percent reliable. Uh, and then some of these areas down here, it starts to get a little bit more reliable for you. So this is why I like to use three games. Um, but I really like to use it in conjunction with my formation report, which, we'll talk about um, in a little bit more detail, but as we do that, I just want to highlight or draw your attention to these three areas that I've highlighted. It's a run after 10 yards. We're seeing that the team 50, 50 run pass. Uh, they like to run twins in ISO. Then we come down here in a down and distance. So after they convert on third down, now we're seeing a bigger run tendency, but now we're also seeing the same formation and the same play as we saw after a run of 10 and then come down to game changing, you know, only one example, but again, we're seeing that same formation and that same play. So as a coach, all right, we're running that same formation and play in a couple of key situations. So again, just an up close version of it. We got the run, we got twins and ISO and then same thing down here. And so this is where you really start to apply the what's next report to self scouting. And as we can kind of see, there's a little bit potentially of a, our play calling bias here. Um, doesn't mean it's a bad thing. I think that's one thing I want to point out just because you have a bias as a coach doesn't mean it's a bad thing. If your best player is your tailback, you should probably run ISO with your best player. I'm not saying that just because you do it a lot that you should steer away from it. Um, and so that it's really decide like, do you adapt? Maybe, instead of getting away from the play, it's just getting away from the formation. Um, you know, cause as I said here, it's getting run after, a, you know, a gain of 10 yards, it's getting run on third down and it's getting run after a big play. So again, it doesn't mean it's bad. It's just, it is, as David mentioned earlier, like the data doesn't lie. This is what we do uh, or what we did. And we just have to decide how to alter that. And I think the formation report is really where you can, then use this to decide, okay, do I need to make a change or do I just need to dress it up and have it look a little bit different? So we'll jump to formation reports here. So this is an overview. If you run a formation report here, I ran this for a bunch formation, pretty, you know, pretty standard that a lot, you know, decent amount of teams will run some type of bunch. So what are some things that jump out here? Well, you're seeing, all right, we ran the ball pass relatively split here, 16 to 12. So not a big tell there. Um, but then what are some things you start to see? So we come over to down in distance again, 70, 30, you know, almost 50, 50 here. And these numbers are a little bit lower on third down. So not a lot, but then when you start to look here in the strength and then motion, this is where you kind of start to see some things. This is just a huge, a huge red flag, I think, for us as a staff, that we're running 85% of the time away from our bunch. Um, 
you know, and, and you can then talk as a staff, all right, why are we doing that? You know, if you can justify it and you're having success, you know, look, we're averaging six yards of play, maybe not the worst thing to continue to do. Uh, but it is good to be aware of that. And we're noticing too, that we're pretty balanced as far as our direction of where the play is going. So we don't have to worry about that, but really that's strong and weak. And then tying that in with uh, any motion. So we're also seeing a big tendency here that the motion is going away from the strength. That makes sense based on the alignment of this formation. But then we're also seeing the motion going with the play a good chunk of the time. So that was us as a staff saying, okay, how, you know, what plays are we running out of it? And can we potentially run those plays out of a different look? Or is there a way we can use motion to motion into a bunch look? And so then we're getting back to a bunch. We're just getting back to there in a different way, uh, which is ultimately what we ended up doing. We started to get ourselves motioning more into a bunch. So we end up with the same formation, but it starts out differently. And, you know, Dave, I know you as a defensive coach, you're going to align differently to a, a compressed two by set here that then motions across rather than just if you start out in bunch. So we found that that was a good adjustment for us and allowed us to continue to run some similar plays there. Um, the other thing I have highlighted off of this, and I think this is hugely important for coaches is to utilize the backfields column and huddle. Uh, the way I explained it to our staff is think of the formation as your base formation. So in this case, bunch is our base formation. And then what we use backfields for any variation of that formation that you might have. And I'll show on the next slide what those are, but they're just listed off here. You know, you have an H back variation, a compressed H back, and then just a compressed without the H back. Um, the reason I want to highlight this as both for offensive and defensive coaches, if I were to lay, put all this information in the formation, now I'm cutting down the data of the formation report and it's not going to be as accurate for me. So if I had a formation called bunch H back, then I had a formation called bunch compressed H back. And then I have another one with bunch compressed. And then I also have bunch. I now have four different variations of the same formation, but it's going to water down all this information. So if I had bunch and H back, I might not pick up this 85% tendency running weak side on bunch. Um, and, I'll, and I'll show how this is the part that I love of it, that huddle will then give you another breakdown just like this for the backfields column itself relative to that formation. We'll see that here. So now in this, we see each of those variations. I have bunch H back, I have compressed H back, and I have compressed, and you'll see how it changes. So we got an H back behind the tackle here. We got an H back behind the tackle. Now that wide receiver is squeezed in, and then just one where the wide receiver is squeezed in. And it depends how many backfield combinations you have. If you know the, we were to send our tail back out, that could be another backfield one that you would have. And now you start to see that data trend that we saw earlier with weak side showing up again. So we're seeing, all right, H back, well, we're running. Now you know they're running towards the H back 80% of the time. Now you know they're running towards the H back 100% of the time. You know, and this one, even with the out, without the H back, we were still running away from it. And I think as a defensive coach, that, that would be hugely helpful for me to know what they're doing from each variation. Right. For us as offensive coaches, it's like, all right, yeah, we need to figure out a way to address this because this is too big of a tendency halfway through the season. You know, a coach like Dave, yourself, you would see this and you probably have your kids screaming some automatic check as soon as we go bunch that, hey, they're not running towards the bunch. It's all, you know, it's all window dressing to go away from it. Um, so for us, this, this has been hugely helpful to what's next. You know, again, going back to that, what's next, I was showing twins with ISO. You know, I could easily pull up a formation report for that one and it would have bared out the same data. You know, it, it, you can really get, into those small details with that formation report. But the what's next I've found is like a good overarching starting point and then dive more into it with the formation report here. Um, Dave, do you guys use much with formation reports or do you guys kind of do that on your own previously or? Yeah, previously we did, but I know we had talked a little bit about this before and I, seeing what you do, I'm, I don't utilize it 
to the extent you do, but I'm going to steal this from you immediately. And, <laughs> uh, and look at that. That's, this is some great stuff. Now, my question to you was now utilizing your staff, how, uh, you know, for that it's, it's, uh, sometimes it becomes a little problematic. I, I remember we talked about, um, subjectivity in, 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 in installing data. So how has that been any, has that been an issue or has that uh, caused any um, slowdown in how you get your data inputted? Yeah. So initially we were having a lot of issues where, and, and I, I was partly to blame for it too. I, I was, I think myself and a lot of coaches who are similar to myself in age, we get deemed the huddle guy or the huddle coach, you know, cause it's like, all right, you know how to use the computer. So figure it out. Right. Um, I was making the mistake of putting all that information in the formation column. And I'm like, why aren't we getting, you know, better reads on what's going on? Right. Uh, and then I realized that, uh, after I started working at huddle and talking to some of the other coaches at huddle, it's like, Hey, use the backfield column because it's going to help break things up more efficiently for you. Um, what we ultimately decided our head coach is our offensive coordinator. So he said, all right defensive coaches you got to learn our formations you've got to learn right. the variations obviously every team is not going to run the same formation but if we can get it close then it's consistent across the board and that's actually translated uh over onto the practice field too right. because say you know if i tell our kids to line up in bunch they know how to line up in bunch if we told our kids line up in a three by one but it's compressed, they're gonna look at us and go, what do you mean three yeah. by one compressed? So it, it, it's really up to the head coach to decide, you know, if they're defensive minded, then it's probably gonna be how the defensive coach labels formations, but you gotta make sure it's consistent across the staff. Cause as you said, if you get that subjectivity, then half the data is written one way, half of it's written, and then right. you're back to square one and it's all kind of meaningless at that point. Um, so that, yeah, that's a good point. Um, the other thing I think you might like is I was talking to our defensive staff about this. I haven't done it previously is using the gap column too, Dave, this might be a really nice one too, for defensive coaches where if you're not getting some good data here from the favorite plays, as long as you're labeling the gap too, that could be a, a, you know, a nice advantage to see, all right, well, they run C gap consistently out of bunch. And then you can kind of put the play, the specific play aside there and just focus on the gap that they're attacking. Um, right. I know that's something I, after I showed our staff, like, oh, that would be a lot more efficient than worrying about necessarily every single play from every variation, just looking at the gap they want to attack. And then we can practice the plays that obviously attack that gap. Absolutely. Um, before huddle assist, trying to get coaches to input those, I mean, I, I would give certain assistants, okay, you have this column, you have this column, you have these three columns, just getting someone to fill out the, the 10 that I need was uh, uh, just like pulling teeth, but huddle assist, if you can put that in and they can label all that stuff for you. Oh my God. It's, it's. So I remember, you know, it, I feel like, all right, I've only been coaching since 2009, but my first couple of years where we still didn't have huddle for me, when I was going to scout the opponent, I would bring a voice recorder and I would just talk the entire time. So that was my way of, since we can't watch a play over and over, I literally would just do play by play and talk into my recorder. That way, when I go home, I can listen to everything on repeat as many times as I need to. And then that's how I was starting to input data into just a spreadsheet to figure out what I was starting to see from these tendencies. Yep. So then once this came along, I was like, all right, well, now I don't have to go drive an hour to watch my opponent and I can watch play a thousand times and the data only has to get put in once. It would just kind of compound it and it went from some really long Friday nights and Saturday mornings into, you know, all right, you know, it's still, there's still a lot of time, but it's much more manageable than it was prior. Right. Oh, it, absolutely. I, and I come from <laughs> B, uh, BC before huddle yeah. and <laughs> And when I look back at that, I, I realized how I was, I was really guessing a lot of the time, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I, I give credit to like my coaches when I was in high school and it's like, how, how did you guys figure out what was going on? 
my head coach at the time was like, well, we've played the same team for 20 years and it's the same guy coaching over there. So at that point, you know what, like he goes, they know what we're doing. We know what they're doing. It's just kind of is what it is. Um, But I feel like, you know, for, especially now our team, we've kind of shuffled leagues and shuffled opponents and huddle, you know, the ability to just grab that film has been hugely helpful where we're not as familiar with teams. Well, and I think that's a big part of it too. You, you no longer, teams no longer just stay in their districts. They don't, you know, the, the contracts they have with teams can be from, you know, the hundred miles away. So it, it's, you know, impossible to get any um, uh, uh, previous game. I mean, you don't know who you're playing from the week, from the year before. Right. I, uh, it's We're not even getting into the California, the, the, the monitors of the world that will schedule like a team from the East coast or, or, or something rather. Right. No. Well, that's what I was going to mention. My senior year, we went and played Beverly Hills high school. And yeah. I remember thinking back on it. Now we happened to play, we played them the two, two years prior to that. And we were just watching film from two years prior. Cause that was all we had on them. We right. had nothing else and it wasn't the same personnel. It was just, Hey, it's right. the same coaching staff. We'll guess this is what we did because, or this is what they'll do because that's what they did two years ago. And I remember, and they were a very different offense. They were much more, you know, this was 2008. They, so spread was starting to kind of pop a bit more and they were all spread. And two years prior to that, they were like an I pro team running more of a pro style offense. And so they went spread and it was like, oh crap, we haven't practiced against this. So right. yeah, it's those you know, a lot more of those out of district games, it, it's been a lifesaver to have this because then you can grab film, you know, or you reach out to a coach in that district and maybe they'll help you out and give you, you know, a couple of films of that team and you're not just getting the last film or two. Yeah, the sharing is is uh, huge. Just finding people that uh, you can network with and find. Uh, yeah, you find out who your true friends. Film. You find out who your true <laughs> friends are when it's a playoff game and you've got two, you know, four to eight hours to break down film. Who's gonna help you out there? Uh-huh. And the, but sometimes the film you get <laughs> is the yeah. worst film you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> and, so, and sometimes that's deliberate too, by the way. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's, uh, Rich, this was awesome to see. Uh, thank okay. you very much for, for showing this. Um, I, I, want great. Last, I want to get to our last segment here. Um, it, because I, I think it's an important one here. Let's, uh, uh, reset the room if we will. Um, Dave, want to go into some of the unique applications um, use with this i mean we talked about self-scout and and um you, you what what attracted me to, to what you guys do in the first place was the fact that you do it on every single scout film and you take that overlap just to see what the model says against different different looks different fronts etc um what prompted you to take this approach i want to I give you the floor to talk talk a little bit about, about the, the way you the ways you uh, you apply it yeah. Well, it, tendencies and situations, like I think, is what we're talking about. And uh, down the distance, it breaks it down so uh, minutely. If the, it can, it gives you the run pass ratio in, in multiple situations. Run pass breakdown in field view, uh, down the distance versus run pass field position versus run pass, and then down versus run pass, and then all the formation breakdowns. And I don't even, like Rich was showing, Rich is much more versed in the formation breakdowns than I am. And uh, so having all that, um, this multiple plane view for breaking down down distance and comparisons gives the best overall uh, view of, of just the team's personality. And, and the, basically that's what you want to see. What's their personality? What do they want to do in, in certain situations? So, I mean, it's, it's, that's how I base the whole game play sheet on. And do you, do you just put more weight into similar styled opponents? Meaning, you know, like I had gone back to, if they're playing an odd front, you look at it, but you just weight it less than an opponent who played a similar defensive front to yourself. Uh, say that again, Rich. I'm trying to digest that. So the, as far as running the reports for every game, right. uh, say, you know, say you're, I, I'm not sure what type of front, if you play an odd or even, but say you play an even front and both opponents previously were odd fronts. Do you 
how do you weight the information and the data that you get oh. from those reports against a defense that is very different than yours? Um, well, the good thing about us, we, we, we run multiple front. So it, it's, it's a curse and a blessing. We can, um, it, if I, if the previous defense was running odd and, uh, they weren't having a lot of success, I can say, okay, we're going to be primarily even this week. Um, let's, let's put this game patch together. There, there are situations where we can run, uh, back to our odd and just kind of switch things up. So I think the, the, it, it does weigh heavily. Um, but I think because we can run multiple front, uh, we have, I have a little bit of an advantage. Um, so, uh, I think, I think, um, as far as game planning goes, um, that, that helps me in what I'm going to run, uh, primarily as a base for that week. Yeah. Cause that, that's interesting. Cause I, as I had mentioned, I hadn't been self scouting in the past game to game, but I, I think if you put it in that context, that there can still be value of running these reports weekly. Um, and then just picking out, you know, the valuable information out of that, just understand might not be as much as one week, but you still might get something useful out of it. Um, it's definitely Absolutely. something I've probably overlooked in the past. Absolutely. And, and what about the, the self scout aspect of this? In, in, in what context, as far as, just kind of just kind of understanding like where you know what the model says to be aware of um with your, with your own tendencies and how 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 a self scout running the what sex report can, can can help you guys out in that yeah so as i said i think that and dave's touched on a lot the down and distance one i think is huge with the what's next for us i know that's what i focus on and what we focus on the most for self scout um because ultimately like as an offensive coach, when our head coach sits down and put together his call sheet, you know, he's doing what Dave does. All right. Like wh what are the plays that I want to run on third and short and Dave, if we're too overly reliant on the same play on third and short, Dave's going to know that and we're going to, and he's going to capitalize on that. Mm -hmm. And I think, as I had said, it doesn't mean completely abandon what you do if you do it well, but it does make you have to have very, you know, variety to what you do and at least what it looks like to that defense. Right. And, and I think that's where the self scouts helped us is made us be more variable in the ways that we run the same play. You know, in the past, if we wanted to just run, you know, a toss or something, it was probably just going to be on a bunch. Uh, and it's all right. How can we get to that? Because the tendency is we're going to run it but I can't just run it out of that same formation on that right. same down and distance. A good coach is going to be aligned to it and you're going to get sniffed out before the play even happens. That's good. That's a good point. I, I recall a, a coach up in new England, a uh, very successful one calling that uh, his last season, he ran his favorite play 94 times out of 23 different formations. Right. It's, it's, I mean, and that, go ahead, Dave. No, you're seeing that a lot. I mean, um, uh, Andy Reid, I think, can run the same play 25 different ways. And, I mean, his, his, his base playbook is probably this big, but the, the multiple aspects he can run that out of are, are in, infinite. Right. It's like the, the Herman Boone line, and remember the Titans, he's like, run six plays, it's like Novocaine, it works every time. Yeah. And if you're variable, yeah, you can get away with running right. six plays. And I, I think – it looks a lot more complex from the outside. And then when you come in, like you ask our kid, and, you know, we're not in most schools and most coaches, I like clinics and coaches where it's all right. This is what I have for personnel. And if you can give me concepts that are simple and I can apply, we're probably only going to pick four or five concepts. I think if right. you start trying to run too many different concepts, that's where your message gets lost as a coach. And then the kids start to look at you like, what, what are we doing? We did this last week. Why are we doing this this week? Be consistent with it, but you can dress it up different ways and present some different problems there on both yeah. sides of the ball. I think those are the teams that give me the most headache are the ones that are, are, 
are consistent. They have, you can see there's discipline in what they run, but what they run is, is, is simple, but complex in the way they present it. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's hard to game plan against a guy like that. Oh, it drives you nuts too. You're sitting there like, I know what they want to do. And you might even know on down and distance, but then they come out and it's like, oh man, we didn't practice this formation. Well, this I, I've, yeah, I've never seen that, that before. Exactly. And you're like, but it's the same play and it just drives you nuts. But you know, it's, you got to tip your cap sometimes and, you know, say, yeah, all right, it has got the, me there. The initial look is I have to change my alignment. Yeah. And they just run the same play. It's just, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah, so gentlemen, we're up on time. I'd be remiss if I didn't go back to this one thing you, you that we talk about a lot, Dave. Um, just what we, we've told you all the time about the data tells you when to go off script. The data is going to tell you when to improvise, which is, is it, I never really thought about it that way, but it, it makes so much more sense. And so having this full, having the full scope is going to tell you when you, you need to go with your gut, right? Right, exactly. Uh, you know, I, there, there, and Rich, I think, can back me up on this. There, there's never been a game where I've been completely 100% on script, ever. You know, nothing ever goes as planned, uh, but you have to be confident in making the calls when when it's going down the toilet. Yeah. Um, that, go ahead. I was going to say, and I, you've been there. I know I've been there. Is, and at one point, if you have a timeout and it's crucial, I don't might not even look at play sheet and so what do you guys want is, is the kids, right. you guys are out there, you get the feel for what's going on. Yep. And I know as a coach, like when I've called plays in the past, I'll go down with my kids. If they, if they want to run this, even if I have the data that might say, you know, we've run that a lot. I'm going to trust my kids at the end of the day, you know, right. the data is going to take you so far, but at the end, if they're not confident in what you're calling when it matters, then the data, the data is irrelevant. So there's that time to look at the kids and say, what do you guys want to do right now? And let, let's execute that. And if we go out with what the kids want to do, I'm okay with that as a coach. That's a great point. And that, that in and of itself gives them the confidence to go after. Cause in, th in those situations too, they're going to be tense and tight and the more confident they are, the better you are. Yeah. Um, uh, but I mean, by the same token, the same data you used to put the script together completely helps you with those gut calls. You know, I think I'm going to add a uh, column in my game sheet that just says gut call. <laughs> it's, it's all based on the data. It's just the, uh, the kind of last resort out of the comfort zone. I just got to do something calls that, that you want to throw in there. So it, even, even the off script stuff has to be based on data. It's just something that's a little more risky. Well, you know, this has been a fantastic, fantastic discussion. Uh, just want to give you a last, last second to, to uh, how can people keep the conversation going with you? They want to reach out to you. What, what's the best way for them to keep the conversation going with you? Uh, for myself, I, I, as a younger coach, believe it or not, I don't use my social media that much. So wow. I'll, uh, I know, right? <laughs> I, I have Twitter. I, just, sure. <laughs> I, don't, I don't use it. Uh, so if anybody wants to contact me, they can reach me uh, via email. It's my first name, richard.upson at huddle.com. Um, that would be the best way to reach me. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone might have after this, and I'll get back to you. Awesome. I, I as well have Twitter, but I don't really use it. So um, – <laughs> Uh, as coach said, the best way to get a hold of me is uh, email. D as in David, D V as in Victor Padilla, P A D I L L A, Jr. at gmail.com. Uh, be happy to talk with anybody. I mean, uh, the more information, the better. So feel free to reach out. Junior is in JR, correct? D Junior as in JR, right? Awesome. Cool. John, thank you very much. This is a fantastic conversation. Uh, I, I really enjoyed this. I hope you guys too. And, and for those watching, enjoy the rest of the week. Thanks, Brennan. Thanks, guys.